uh, Brian, I'm going to do a little introduction for you. I'm going to start with you're a friend of the museum. So that's, that's pretty true. Uh, and your parents are on the call, which is they want to wave now. <laughs> We're so glad you're here. Uh, and wife and child are on the call. It's a family affair today, which is lovely. So you... My aunt um, is on too. Oh, we haven't been introduced to her yet. <laughs> they're, they're somewhere. I, I lost track of where they went. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's see, you joined m and Type in 2008. Um, and yeah. the Typecasting Apprentice, right? Yep. And, um, but now you are co-manager m and H's daily operations. You uh, maintain the historic casting machines and presses. You work with the presses as needed. So are you kind of just everything and all around there now? Yeah, yeah. And apparently I'm facilities manager, whatever that means. I change light bulbs, you know, stuff like that. Uh, Jim Moran can relate to that when, when you only have so many people on staff, right? <laughs> Jim, we all need to do our part. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yes. Delayed me. So I am going to hand it over um, because I'll let you tell. We're in San Francisco when we're with you, so tell us a little bit more about it, and then um, yeah, let us know what's up. Thank you for being here, Brian. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for inviting me. I'm a little nervous because I haven't done it like. This before, I've given lots of tours and talked about uh, the shop before, but this is kind of odd and off-putting, but it's kind of fun to see all your faces. Uh, I don't see Jason, so that's okay. Um, so uh, what we have here is, um, well, we're m and type, Mackenzie and Harris. Uh, we're part of Arion Press, uh, which uh, if you don't know who they are, which is who we are, uh, we print limited edition books. Uh, by the way, if I'm talking too loudly, let me know. Uh, so we print limited edition books, typically three titles a year, typically uh, 150 to 300 copies of each of those titles. Um, we cast all the types here on these monotypes. Um, also over there on what are called Thompson casters. Uh, and yeah, um, you've all seen monotypes before. Do you know what a monotype is? Anybody? Uh, just yes and some no's. Okay, I'm going to talk about the monotype a little bit, all right? Uh, by the way, if you're ever in town, we're in the Presidio. Uh, just call me up and, and we'll figure out a way to get you in to come see it, okay? If, you know, we're allowed to travel again. Um, so these are monotypes. They were developed in around uh, 1893 or so. Uh, you know, everybody was hand setting type forever. Uh, and during the Industrial Revolution, they really wanted to find a way to set type faster. A um, couple machines came out. One of them, the first big one, was the Linotype. Uh, which we don't have one of those, but they're fun if you ever get a chance to play one. this one. Um, the other machine that came out was the Monotype. Uh, one of the cool things about the Monotype, uh, with the Linotype, you cast a slug. That's not one. Hold on. There we go. So you got a slug, the letters on the top, right? With the monotype, what you have is uh, individual pieces of type. So it's just like you are casting, uh, just like you're hand setting the type, but uh, instead of it being a slug where if you make an error, you would have to throw the slug away and recast it, you can put this in a composing stick and, and fix everything. Uh, again, this is off-putting, this is kind of, odd how I'm, how I'm thinking. Um, so, there we go. So what I'm doing right now is actually casting our next book, uh, Sea of Cortez by uh, John Steinbeck. And um, what we do is you create a ribbon like this on a keyboard. And you see all those little punch holes? Those punch holes correspond to a particular spot on this, which is a mat case. Now the mat case is super awesome. It's got all of your letters, uh, your caps in your lowercase, uh, and in Roman and in italic, in uh, one particular point size and one particular face. So this moves around right here. Every time this little guy here is a pump, if I can move this a little bit better so you can see it, maybe not. Uh, there's a pot of molten lead right here that shoots lead up into a primary mold. This. This. 
moves around and gets pushed on top of it. Lead shoots into it, uh, into the chamber, and then uh, the letter is fast, and then it gets pushed out, pushed out, pushed out. Um, the mold comes up. So this is uh, the point size is from here to here. The width of the character is this, so it's controlled. The size of the character is controlled by this blade, and it's controlled by this wedge. The caster doesn't like me right now, so I'm just going to let you know that. Uh, so this, depending on the width of the character, wherever uh, the settings land, this will be fatter characters, this will be thinner characters. Um, it's kind of hard to see over the screen, but hopefully you kind of get a, an idea of how it works. Um, so when it stops, if there's a problem, it will stop, and you have to go over and fix it. It up again. Uh, one thing that it doesn't do is insert lighting, which is what we have to do. Hold on one sec. So we always have our lighting freshly cut, and as the lines get ejected, we insert a piece of lighting in between each one. So we do have to kind of stand here and keep track of how everything works. Um, yeah. Normally, I have people ask questions while I'm doing this, so just kind of weird. Um, if you want questions, people can speak up as you go, Brian. That's no problem. Does, is, does anybody have any questions or want me to talk about anything in particular? Uh, I see Richard Argog wave. Hey, yeah. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just going to ask whether you do keyboarding or whether you use a Mac to ribbon generator. So uh, up until we have been using uh, for our bigger books, we were using uh, the Monroe Postman system um, and we did still keyboard books up until a few years ago. But then when the uh, when Bill Welliver came out with his system, uh, we started using that because uh, there's American monotype and English monotype and nobody's making at least the American monotype paper anymore. And so uh, we have a very small amount of it, and so we're saving it. And it's just easier to use uh, Bill Welliver's system, which if you guys can see, it kind of looks like a spine over there. Um, that hooks up to a Mac where we make a digital spool, so a digital form of this. Um, we haven't actually keyboarded a full book in uh, in South of Heaven whenever that was. Uh, Four years ago, five years ago, I think. So effectively, the will of a system is uh, using digital inputs to use pressurized air to make the equivalent uh, of the puff of air. That much sure. Yeah. 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 That's exactly it. Um, it's a really, really amazing system, uh, and there are a few people who are using them right now. Um, nobody on this call that I can see, but. Um, um, I was at the Type Archive here in London, UK, uh, today, where there is one. We we have one set up there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Bill, the same thing's going out there. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, this is the caster running our next book. Um, in a little while, I'll be setting up the caster next to it to run all of the running heads, uh, which are in a different point size and a different face. And then there are all the footnotes, uh, which I'll also be setting up and running that. Uh, this will will uh, have, I, we'll be running this. Yeah, I, I just have one one question. Your um, your machine seems to be running at about one cycle per second. So in that in that one second, uh, the the mold is formed, the lead is added, it cools down, the piece is taken out. Yep, that that's exactly it. So every time uh, you hear a katunk katunk katunk, that's a new piece being uh, cast gonna stop it there for a second because that uh that's bad what just happened so Amazing. three three lines pie, got pied so i'll have to go back and fix that um yeah it is it the system is really amazing and when we uh went on a good day uh i mean all these machines uh are vary from 1915 to 1960 with parts from different years um keeping them going is uh is Kind of a pain, <laughs> kind of difficult. Uh, they, especially MNHs, uh, MNH like has been around since 1915, and they really, 
really wore their machines out. Um, and so a lot of our time here is spent in just trying to maintain and keep them running in a, in a decent fashion. Uh, so, um, other things that are going on here. So I'm going to pick you up and walk you around a little bit so you can see some of the other fun stuff in here. I'm going to ask one question while you walk. Uh, yes. Jim wants to know what the addition is on the Sea of Cortez and what's the approximate cost? That's a really good question. Uh, I believe it's on our website. Uh, I don't actually know. I forgot. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, because we're doing, uh, oh, actually, this one's kind of cool, and I'm going to stop for a sec. We are, mm -hmm. wait, with that behind me. There we go. Um, we are casting the book. So the, the boat for the Sea of Cortez, uh, the, the uh, what's it called? Oh, now I can't remember. But anyway, it's being fixed up in Port Townsend, and they're, redo they're fixing it, uh, and they took a lot of the old lumber off and replaced it. And so we are actually getting some of that wood to uh, go into, so we have our, our limited edition, then we have our deluxe edition, and the deluxe edition will, uh, in theory, have a slipcase made from those boards, from the actual ship. Uh, and I think we are currently trying to find a way to make kind of a, a laminate, uh, thinly stripped piece of wood for labels for the limited edition cover. So hopefully bits of the book, or the boat will actually be in the book, um, that's, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so I'm going to bring you in here. This is our mat case room. So the mat case I showed you with uh, the little br br brass squares, uh, each of these mat cases is a different point size of a different typeface. Um, so say, let's just grab one, uh, 337, everybody's favorite, original old chasm. We have seven point, this will be hopefully eight point, yep. Eight point, nine point. So each of these little slots is a different mat case. Um, we have quite a few, if you can't tell. Uh, M&H has been buying uh, mats or had been buying the entire time that essentially Monotype uh, existed. Um, over here, we have larger mats for our larger sizes. Um, and so that's pretty cool. Here's something that we have. So all of these little drawers are filled with mats. There are backups. Uh, some of them are accents. Each of these has a different face. Some of them are stuck. Everybody's favorite centaur right here. Yay. Um, can you see that pretty well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of these drawers are filled with little mats. Um, and while they do have numbers on them indicating where they should be, sometimes Sometimes they're not there. So a good, say, day or two could be spent just trying to find one mat. Say I lost, or not me, not me, I never lose anything. Um, say an accented uh, A is missing, then I have to go search through all those drawers and try to find it. Uh, not fun. I'd like to show you, you these guys. Real oh, quick, that, do the, Jessica go wants to know, do the mat cases ever wear out? They do, uh, especially if you're, running it way too fast at way too, way too high a temperature, um, you can burn the mats out. And also, you know, over time, uh, we have some old uh, centaur that the mats just wore out because it got used so much for so many years. Um, so we have to be careful with, with how everything is treated. Uh, don't drop them, that's a big thing. Um, what is the fix if you have to fix it? <clears throat> can you fix it? Hopefully you can call Duncan at the okay. Type Archive. Okay. Um, but then, you know, yeah, um, that's, that's pretty much the only way I know. Um, also, uh, he's not making, a, there are some mats that you could get made into flat mats mm -hmm. and then cast them on the Thompson, but that's not something I really would like to do because it costs a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, these are Thompsons for, for everybody. Uh, these cast uh, smaller sizes, but we use them for 14 to uh, 48 point type. By the way, if it seems quiet here, it's because I'm the only one here. There's only one other guy and we alternate weeks to, uh, for you know shelter in place and isolation and all that. Um, I can't show you the press room today because there are people in there and uh, also I lose connection by the time I get there. So uh, I can show you that some other time. 
Is there anything anybody would like to see in particular? No? Set you down. Um, I do this here at work, but I would also like to share a quick screen with you, if I may. If I can figure out how to do it. Do, do, do. There we go. Hold on one sec. By the way, I don't know if it's the best thing to be have greasy hands on a touch tablet, but I, I hope so. Don't, nobody say anything about that to my parents. Um, okay, so here we go. <laughs> There we go. Um, if I may, I would just like to show you my presses at home because they make Thanks me do. very happy. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Can you all see that? Yes, we see a garage. Yeah, that's pretty much all it is. <laughs> um, it's a, the, I have a little 10 by 15 uh, new style. It's name is Augie. I don't have a lot of type, uh, but Two cases is probably good enough. It's mainly stuff that I would probably never use. Um, and then if I next one, and then I also have a 219 AB, uh, which I picked up in San Francisco for 500 bucks about a year ago. Really exciting about uh, excited about that. But that's my little shop. So I also like to do this kind of thing outside of work as well as inside of work. Don't get to do a lot of the printing here. Um, yeah. What kind of things do you like to print at home? Uh, well, I'm supposed to be printing the, uh, the uh, birth announcement for our 18-month-old. It's, <laughs> it's a bit late, but, you know, everybody will enjoy that, right? <laughs> um, let's go back to this. Uh, I could show you more photos in a little bit. Um, but, yeah, so uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, David wants to know what your favorite face and least favorite face to cast are. Um, ooh, my favorite face to cast is anything 12 point American. Um, and the reason is these are all uh, US or uh, American monotype machines. And so they run best with American mats and, and uh, yeah, 12 point, 12 set. It is so easy to run. You can just set it and walk away it makes me really happy um the worst six point anything six point is terrible it's just an awful awful day if you're gonna have to cast six point um because some of the thinner sizes could be about one and a half points uh and it just it just takes forever <laughs> um but my favorite yeah favorite typeface overall i've actually been really liking garamont by gaudi um M&H, before it became M&H, it was called the uh, Western Monotype Corporation, and they printed uh, a lot of their stuff in Garamond. And it was really just, it looked really pretty. And I never thought I would like it, but I, once I saw it, I really, really liked it. I think I have a little. Um, and I saw somebody ask the largest type size, point size, uh, and we actually can do 72 point, and we have a face that's 84 on a 72 point body. Uh, but that is pretty much, 72 is the biggest we do. Um, I think Greg Walters is the only one who can do bigger right now because he's got a Barth caster. And I forgot what size he can do. Oh, by the way, speaking of Gaudi, I love this. So uh, Arion Press came out of uh, the Grabhorn Press, essentially. Uh, we have a lot of their equipment. So the Grabhorn brothers were fine printers in San Francisco from 1919 until about 1960. Edwin died in like or 68, I think. Um, but one of the things was they were all buddies with uh, Frederick Gowdy. So it was Colonel Harris, who was part of Mackenzie and Harris. Um, and Gowdy made them a typeface, proprietary typeface called Franciscan. Uh, he get, he cast them the type, gave them the mats or the mats, and then M and H cast cast them a bunch of it. Um, but apparently, and I want to share this because I really like it. I was going through a lot of our old archives, and I found this letter from Gaudi. And by archives, I mean uh, bankers' boxes, unlabeled, 
up on a shelf somewhere. Um, and I don't know if you can see this, but this is Gaudi writing to Edwin Grabhorn saying, where's my money? Uh, essentially, it's like, be a good fellow and pay me for my maths because I spent all this time. Um, but it's kind of fun to see stuff like that. Uh, the Grabhorns apparently were always short money. As was Gaudi, apparently. Um, I also found, oh, I was going to bring this up. Some of the things uh, we also are working on here is uh, upstairs we have a really, really lovely gallery that we uh, have a bunch of shows in. Recently we had a, a original uh, blocks and art from uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada. And that was a great show. And then uh, the COVID happened and everything shut down. We have the Handbook Finders uh, show going up right now. Hopefully people can see it, and I believe we'll have a digital uh, viewing place at some point. Um, one, another thing we're hoping to do down the line is uh, Mary Grabhorn, who is Edwin Grabhorn's daughter, she did a lot of artwork for their uh, versions of Shakespeare, Shakespeare plays, and uh, nobody talks about her ever. <laughs> In fact, they tend to just not say anything about her. But she did some really cool dark things, and I, and I came across a couple stashes of her artwork, preliminary drawings, uh, um, are these spelled uh, holiday cards? Are you seeing the holiday cards? I'm sorry. I, uh, no, you're good. We can okay. see that. It's a little small because we see that in your um, like oh. internet. Um, yeah, I, can't, I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, the, these are really, really great images. And uh, so hopefully we'll have a display and a talk about her. Um, also coming down the line, I'm hoping to, uh, I've been doing research in uh, 1903, the Pacific State Site Foundry in San Francisco got robbed by two guys. And there were a whole bunch of newspaper articles on it. And uh, I've discovered a whole lot, including their mug shots from San Quentin. And so I'm hoping to uh, do a talk about that at some point. It's the guy on the far left and the guy on the far right. Um, but those are the things I'm working on. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, is there more uh, anybody would like to see? Oh, can you show us the hallway of type or is that out of the range? You know what, let's go do that. <laughs> All right. And normally I'm not this discombobulated. I'm pretty discombobulated, but, oh. That's a whole lot of type metal. Um, this is about a ton and a half of uh, lead that I melted about two weeks ago. Um, all of our old books, when we're done with them, we don't distribute it. We melt it down and then throw it back in the pots. Um, somebody did a potato uh, emoji, I think, on Facebook the other day. Um, that is because we always have a potato laying around. And in case you're wondering why, why do you need a potato? Uh, it's agitating the eutectic. So this is the pot we melt all the lead in. We take the potato, we shove it onto this uh, thing here, and then we lower it into the molten lead, and it just starts churning around and churning around. Um, and it keeps all the lead, tin, and antimony uh, mixed up so that when you go to pour it into the mold, it uh, comes out at a you know, somewhat decent level. Uh, here is, that's a mold. Normally it's a very, very hot day. And it's, like I said, we'll normally melt anywhere from two to three tons of lead. And it's one person picking everything up and then melting it and then picking it up and stacking it. Here we go into the hallway. Can you remelt that uh, infinitely, like as much as you want? You can remelt it and remelt it. What we do is we get it checked, uh, we get it analyzed. And if uh, there's not enough tin or antimony in it, we will then uh, add whatever we need. So we send it out to Rota Metals. They'll be like, oh, you need X amount of tin to build up your pot, uh, you know, to this level. And so then we'll add that. Nice. And then there we go. This Ooh. is a hallway of lead. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so we're not currently, uh, due to uh, the San Francisco laws right now, we're not currently casting for uh, for sale, um, for production. Uh, but if you call an order and we have stuff on the shelf, I can ship it out and do all that. But uh, casting currently is not happening except for our book. 
Sorry. No, that's a great hallway. Hallway O type. <laughs> hallway O type. And then uh, if you ever wanted to know what a monotype look like looks like when it is torn apart. <gasps> no, I'm working on it. I'll get it. It'll, it'll, oh, okay. be, it'll, be, do okay. it'll be done at some point. <laughs> um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, there were some good questions about like, what's the size of the building? Um, how long has M&H been there? So the building is, uh, I actually don't know that. You there? Yep. Okay, did you see hear me say, oh crap, I just turned it off? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you are black. Oh, there we go. Oh, there. <laughs> okay, good. Um, the building is really, really big. I, I actually don't know how big it is, but Brian, we do have, yeah. It's 14,000 square feet. Oh, hey, Sarah, thanks. Sarah says it's 14,000 square feet. Is that upstairs and downstairs? Yes, okay. Um, so we are able to have a uh, separate, separate rooms. So we have our bindery, we have our press room, and then we have here. Uh, upstairs, we have a gallery and our shipping area and kind of a little uh, store, which uh, will never be as cool as Hamilton's little store there, uh, but we're hoping someday to have it be kind of close. Um, I've bought lots of goodies in your store, so. There, there are some cool things. We're, we're, we're getting up there. Um, and then, so what was the other question? Uh, how, we've been here since 2000. Uh, m &H was in their spot from 1927 until 1972, moved to Bryant Street. Arion Press joined them on Bryant Street, and then in 2000 moved over here. During the first tech boom, uh, everybody got kicked out of that area of town. And so uh, luckily the Presidio had this building, and it works out really, really nicely for us. And we're in the Presidio, and it's very pretty. So. Um, but there are more people moving in. Lately, for years, we were completely isolated. There was no one around. It was nice and quiet. Now we have people walking around. Kind of How weird. dare they? <laughs> How dare they enjoy the sun? Um, yeah, uh, there was something else. Do we have a list, I think it said, of stuff we have on the shelf? No, but that's what we're planning. Uh, we are planning to, oh, hey, Chad. Um, we are planning to uh, do a newer inventory and try to post that so everybody can see. And then you can buy all the stuff we have on our shelves. Ooh. It's a lot of fun stuff, like things that are ultra bold, ultra condensed, ultra bold, ultra wide, you know, things that everybody uses all the time. It's stuff that nobody uses ever. <laughs> it's the Mullins dancing, and so you got some Wisconsin buyers looking for your type though. Yeah, there we go. Bob Mullen. Mm -hmm. They've been joining uh, us on lots of our calls. Oh, cool. Sherrod wants right. to know how your, uh, how your ventilation is there. Oh, it's actually really good. That was one of the big things when they moved in. I wasn't involved with that, which is probably good. Um, you see all the pipes above us. Each pot has, uh, you know, its own chimney that leads up to that kind of hood, which then goes out, out that way. Um, it's really good. Uh, unless I'm using the L rod and changing the oiler on it, never gets too bad in here. It's not too smoky or anything like that. Um, but yeah, and then if it gets bad, we can open up the garage door. Nice. For sure. We did smoke out the building one time. We melted a whole bunch of old type that somebody brought that had been in five gallon buckets in somebody's barn. And there's so much stuff in it and we melted it down and it just, the whole room went up in smoke and smoked out the hallway all the way down to the bindery. Felt kind of bad about that. But. Are you officially allowed to talk about that? <laughs> yeah, no, it happens. We, we try not to let it happen, but it, it's happened. <laughs> we have ventilators. Do you cast and sell spacing material? Yes, we do. Uh, we uh, have quite a bit uh, always on hand. Some of the larger sizes we don't have currently because we have been very, very far behind. Circular hey, quads, no, no we can't. I heard, hey Brian. Yes, um, do you have an apprentice? Uh, I remember when we walked through there, you could run everything, but 
I didn't know if every anyone else could run everything in there. Uh, no, and actually, uh, there are a couple things I'm I'm really sketchy on, and so we haven't been casting on those. I need to to work on them. Um, so Chris and I uh, have everything pretty much covered here, but uh, we are planning on having a. Uh, we we were actually looking for um, uh, apprentice apprentice applicants. Uh, and we got a bunch and then kind of things, you know, the world fell apart there for a little bit. So uh, down the line, we, we definitely will be uh, getting somebody, uh, hopefully. Um, we have some people who keep texting and, and it's really nice. So <laughs> they, they really want to work here. Uh, Ivan, you had a question about the Welliver system. Mm -hmm. I call it the Welliver system because Bill Welliver made it. I don't know if it actually technically has a name. We were calling it Willie. That's just it. I <laughs> uh, saw another question, but I missed it. Oh uh, yeah, there's a couple. Have you ever had your blood tested as a baseline for heavy metals? They yes. said, uh, okay. Every six months. Uh, I haven't recently because again, world fell apart. Um, but get we get our, our lead levels checked. Um, and then the state calls us and says, it's a little high. And then we say, okay. And then it goes down and then it goes back up and it goes down. So um, it's never been overly, I've never had overly high lead level. Oh, Comcat. Oh, hey, Glenn. <laughs> uh, Bill Wellover calls it Comcat, uh, the system that runs our computer right now. That's great. Thank you, Glenn, for sharing that. <laughs> Not Jason. <laughs> Yeah, he tried to sneak in. <laughs> Can you cast Gaudi Franciscan? No. <laughs> that was my question. But <laughs> so those those were the maps that uh, that Gaudi made for the for the grab horns yeah. and the where they went. Nobody knows. In uh, Colonel Harris's uh, oral history, he talks about how. The Grabhorn said that M&H had him. M&H said, no, we gave them back to you. When they, the theory is that when they moved from their building, the Grabhorn brothers, uh, it might've, they might, the mats might've just gotten thrown out by accident. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some mats that were made, I think in India about 15, 20 years ago, uh, but the, the depth of drive wasn't right. Uh, and then I think the only other person, Theo Rehack made his version or re, re uh, carved them and was casting them, but I don't know where those mats are or if anybody has them actually. So, sorry. We have a whole lot of, we have a bunch of cases of them. I think you might talk to Sky Shipley. I think he modified his Thompson to cast the weird Indian depth of drive. Oh, did he? Okay. Cause he has, he has a foundry, uh, foundry handle. So if he got Theo's mats, he could cast them on a, on a Thompson. Well, what I was saying is, I think he has a way to modify oh, Thompson to cast those Indian mats as well. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, Can I ask I'll... him? Is Sky on here somewhere? No. Okay. Chad. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah. Any other? If you want to see our shipping, no, you don't want to see the shipping area. It's the most boring place in the building. But all of you really, really need it because it's the only place we can ship stuff. But it's it's not very exciting. It's the most used spot in our building. Well, and I have been um, taking a lot of the calls from chat, but I mean, it's a great time if anybody wants to unmute and ask. Please feel free. Um, yeah, I do much time. better when, when people ask me questions. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. I mean, that's why we started these, was to have conversations, so. Uh, somebody's asking about Hebrew mats. So yeah. uh, we don't have any. Uh, if you want, you can talk to uh, Ed Rayer at Swamp Press. He has some. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Mark Sergianis got a lot of uh, uh, mats from... from uh, Anyway, uh, Monroe Postman, uh, but he's not really selling it for sale, or he's not selling it. Um, and maybe Sky has some, but I don't know about that. But definitely, definitely, uh, Ed Rayer has some. Swamp Press, great guy. Great. Uh, Y'all wanna ask a question? 
Mm. Careful if you're quiet too long, Jason Wedekind will speak up. <laughs> did you get a haircut? How did you get a haircut? Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I saw your dad. I was like, hey, I know that dude. Yeah, you know him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Questions. Just throw them out there. Uh, what, what plans do you have next? Uh, the next plans, I mean, for our main focus for here is to, uh, the question was, what plans do we have next? Is to cast uh, South of, or you know, Sea of Cortez. Um, once that's done, uh, I don't know if it's next up in line, but we're, uh, it's looking like we're going to be uh, printing a book by Patty Smith, uh, which is really exciting. Um, and then there are other things, but I can't remember exactly what right now. <laughs> My How main focus. Does... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. What's your main focus? Uh, uh, casting this, which if you were going to ask how long it takes to cast, uh, is a while. It depends on the length of the book. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, you say it's about an hour a galley. Uh, mm -hmm. Galley is anywhere from 60 to 80 lines. Uh, so we'll do, say it's 100 galleys, that's uh, 100 hours minimum. But that's, mm -hmm. we still have to format and get everything else ready. That's not including any running heads or anything else uh, that needs to be done. So a long time, a very long time. Oh, we just finished a book, uh, Willa Cather, uh, A Lost Lady, um, that actually we cast very quickly. It was only like 30 galleys, so 30 hours straight of casting. Um, that is being bound right now. Megan is somewhere online watching, uh, but they're down there folding all the, the sheets and then, yeah. Brian, does m &H take Hellbox donations? Yes! Yes, we do. If you want to send us your old lead and want us to melt it down, we will take it. Yeah. Um, who is a proofreader? We are all proofreaders here. Um, it's whoever isn't busy at that time. Um, normally when we proofread, so what we'll do is we'll, uh, hold on, show you this. All right, once a galley is done, uh, we'll take them out and we'll, you know, do a, can't really see it, but we'll do a galley proof. Um, and then somebody will normally read against copy right then uh, and make any correct, then the corrections will be made, take another proof, somebody else will check that the corrections are made. From there, it gets made into uh, page galleys. Uh, so we'll do all the page makeup uh, out there. And then once that's done, uh, two people, uh, recently it's been Megan and Alice, uh, one person will read out loud uh, the original copy to another person who will then make any corrections. So every stop, every bang, every you know comma, every accent, if it's italicized, everything is read out loud. Um, so that way you have more people looking at it. Um, and then when we go on press, we have at least two people uh, reading through press sheets to check for uh, for anything strange. Um, and yeah, nothing ever goes wrong. Uh, everything uh, everything <laughs> goes right all the time. That's all of our lives. And we should get you guys uh, red pens for Christmas. Is that a good gift for all of you there? Yes. Actually, uh, we just use pencil, but oh, red okay. pens actually would probably be better. Catch everything. <laughs> Um, this is uh, making patches. Uh, there was an issue with some of the casting. And this is good that we read the galleys as they come out because in a mat case, this thing, uh, these are all individual pieces. So uh, if you get a squirt, uh, squirt is where lead shoots up and can shoot out normally at you. Uh, but sometimes the lead gets in between the, the mats themselves. And so you have to clean out the mats. Um, when you clean out the mats, you have to make sure you put them back in the right place. Uh, not saying I've done this, but uh, one time we were casting and for some reason all the E's and A's were switched uh, in one galley. Not the entire thing, but in one galley. So we had to go back, recast that whole thing. Um, and all sorts of things can go wrong. Sometimes uh, this bottom, there's, this is called a, this is the back of the mat case and these are all cone holes. Um, one time a little bit of lead got into the lowercase f of our 16 point centaur. Um, and nobody caught it right away. And so we ended up, uh, what it did was it shifted the, the character on the body. 
So all of the Fs were off. Um, and we had to go through, I think, eight galleys and change all the Fs. Um, there were a lot of Fs in Don Quixote. And now you uh, know that. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it, you really got to pay attention. <laughs> so much can go wrong so quickly. How many people work there, uh, both uh, Ariane and M&H? Uh, we're, we're essentially just one now. Uh, okay. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six downstairs and two upstairs and then one person who uh, still kind of works here and she's in, she's in LA right now. She just, just moved uh, recently. So, um, so yeah, that's it. So uh, all the casting that we do for orders, all the casting we do for books. We also, uh, Chris and I, it's, uh, Chris Godek and I are in the foundry. Um, we're in the press room. There, there was one year where I spent the entire year in the press room, uh, didn't go into the foundry. So we, you know, we all kind of have to go around to do everything as, as much as possible. So, and we repair our, our own stuff to our to the best of our abilities. I mean, like I can't machine anything, uh, but other people can, and you can pay them to do it. So that's kind of nice. Um, yeah, pandemonium cast on a slanted body. Not that I know of. Uh, somebody asked if monotype cast on uh, on a slanted body. Uh, I've never seen a mold that can do that. So I'm I'm gonna guess no. Y'all know what slanted body type is? It's set it up like this, kind of at an angle. It's pretty neat. Um, any other questions? And you could just ask them and you don't have to type them. Brian, did you ever find out what that menu press was all about? That really cool, no. uh, I, I, I was trying to hunt down. I never found any more details either. It was very cool. We have, we have yeah, Glenn's talking about this one. Uh, we have this menu press that has no markings on it, no labels, nothing. And I spent a long time trying to figure out where it, is, where it was from, what it was, I, nothing. Uh, it's, it looks like it was a one shot or one off type of thing. Maybe a demo model. Uh, because it had four drawers filled with uh, linotype slugs of different uh, types of things for a menu. It was a menu press and it was amazing, uh, but nobody knows what it is. <laughs> so uh, I, I'll repost it on Instagram if anybody wants to look. And I have a question for everybody out there. If anybody has a 10 by 15 CMP, a new style, with the uh, full uh, ink, uh, not distributor, you know, the ink fountain uh, attachment. Could you send me some pictures of how it's attached? Because I have an attachment and I don't have, uh, I don't know how it goes on. So, I mean, I know where the two bolts go, but that's about it. So, just send it to me. That'd be nice. This is a good group to ask that question. Exactly. I, I was waiting to ask that. <laughs> hey, Brian, I'm just curious about what your, um, lead time is like how long you how long you guys plan for each project and how many projects you like to have lined up so you feel like you're able to pay your bills and whatnot that's, that's a really good question i keep looking over at sarah uh um <laughs> that's that's something uh we're really working on so we had a really big change here uh over the last couple of years our, our old uh, director uh, uh retired and so um the last couple of years, it was just the six, seven, seven, eight or us kind of running everything. Um, and now we, uh, so we were getting our books out, but it was kind of, none of us has the business sense <laughs> to, to figure that kind of thing out. Um, but we uh, recently, uh, a gentleman by the name of Rolf Black joined us. Uh, and so we're, we're working on that. We try to have, we, at different points, there will be different books in production. So typically, if there's something going on in the bindery, we, uh, oh, my mom wants me to introduce Sarah Songer. Hi, Sarah. Um, that's Sarah Songer. She worked here for a very long time. Um, she's at the center for the book now. Uh, so uh, like right now, we're casting Sea of Cortez. In the uh, bindery, they're binding it, uh, binding uh, uh, a lost lady. So now in the press room, they're working on getting ready for whatever is going to come after Sea of Cortez, also be making up pages. So uh, we're, we try to have three books ahead, mm -hmm. um, but you know, it, uh, you, paper, because books take a lot of paper. So figure, you know, we, we have to start thinking about that pretty early on. Um, 
but yeah, we, we typically, there, there's something in production, like one book is in the bindery, one's in the foundry, almost at all times. That's great. Yeah. Uh, it does get hard to cast type for orders, just reminding everybody about that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, Rochelle's here too. Uh, Rochelle also works here. Uh, if you see her, okay. Hi, Rochelle. <laughs> She's upstairs right now folding Hi. sheets. I, I can't see everybody, but I think uh, I think Lake might be on. He's in the press room. Uh, Megan is on. She's in the bindery. I don't know who else is on, but they they work here. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah, there was one earlier that said, "Are your sales going well? Did COVID affect?" Uh, affect your sales? I think we're, well, it depends. Uh, we just had a lot of emails to get back to. Um, so it seems a lot of people are buying type, which is great. Um, sales are not what keep M&H going, it's the books. Uh, we, we keep casting type for people, the books keep us going. Um, so we try to keep on top of everything, but the, the I don't even know if it pays our salary at the amount of type we sell, but we do it to keep doing it because uh, we want people to keep printing. So that's um, it's an important resource, that's for sure. Yeah, and and you know there, uh, I think Sky wasn't casting either, but his sales seemed to be. I think he was saying it was going pretty well. So, you know, people people need type while they're uh, locked into their houses. Though so things are opening up now, so that's what they say. I don't believe it. Maybe not everywhere. Wisconsin not everywhere. Uh, not, beat everybody to that punch, but yeah. Well, you guys are all at the bar right now, right? That's, um, yes. Daily. Uh, things are no. not opening up here. <laughs> not yet. Um, yeah. Questions? Sharon? Sharon? Hi, Sharon. East Bay. Uh, hey, Brad. Else got something. Yeah? Do, do you know that uh, what the process is when they choose to do a book like a Steinbeck, or you've certainly done a number of well-known poets as well. Somebody has to get permission for copyright on that, right? That That is uh, something that we, yes, uh, we were discovering all of that. Uh, so uh, again, our old director typically got the permissions and, and the artists, um, and now uh, the new director is, is doing that. So, uh, See a lost lady. We did have to go through and get permission. Yeah, you you do have to pay for copyright and all that. Um, it's nice when you can do stuff that's out of copyright because then you don't have to worry too much. <laughs> um, but then we also work with artists who you know they get royalties uh, on on everything. So uh, yeah, now that we have somebody because it was kind of us trying to figure that out. Uh, now we have somebody who can figure that out for us. <laughs> Very important position. <laughs> All right. Any um, other questions? I don't have any questions, but I just, I've only been to see your spot once, but it's so beautiful there. So I highly recommend it. It's uh, just a gorgeous spot and the space is so well laid out. And the, pr the press room is awesome. So just hope everyone can get there. You've only been here once? Yeah. Remember really? I brought all those buckets? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I thought you'd been here more. OK. I've probably uh, just been more like at SFCB or other. Yeah, that's probably it. SFCB is San Francisco Center for the Book for those not, not in San Francisco at this time. And you were saying you're going to do a talk with them later in the month, right? Yeah, essentially it's this. This is kind of the dry run, I think. Um, <laughs> This is really exciting. I, uh, yeah, so we'll be doing uh, in different departments. So we'll start here and then I guess a few weeks later we'll do the press room and then a few weeks later do the press, do the bindery. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like I know most of these people. I don't know if I'm going to know those people. So this is, this is a good way to move in. <laughs> Thanks, and Anna. I tried to see if I could find the um, event on their site, but I couldn't find it quickly. So I've just shared their um, their link over in the chat. So um, I think it'd be fun. This is a good dry run, but we can all, it'd be fun to see uh, all the spaces together as well. So that's really cool. Um, 
Yeah, does anybody else have anything you need to ask or anything? Okay. <laughs> Brian, are you gonna gonna host a local gathering for the Ways Goose? Wait, what? Is the Ways Goose? <laughs> I'm hosting. Uh, sure. Right. Wait, that's that's he's, what I he's, heard. He's part of the San Jose Printers Guild, and they they typically do all the this area ways goose. So oh, the Hamilton ways goose. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. That'd be fun. This is how uh, we ask people. We just put plants into the uh, into the audience, and then they uh, put somebody on the spot and ask them. <laughs> well, we did host uh, the uh, ATF the Typecasting Fellowship Conference here a couple of years ago, and it went pretty well, I think. Nothing got broken. Well, not too much got broken. So it's a good space for that kind of thing. Why not? Well, to that point, I will let everyone know on this call, if you don't know, um, we are going to have our Ways Goose this year, but we are going to do it online. So instead of bringing everybody to Two Rivers, we cannot wait to see you on Zoom or some other digital platform. And so we are calling it a Ways Goose. So that's Ways Goose with an A at the front. Uh, we love puns because we're printers. <laughs> so um, I will put, we're in the process of um, announcing our speakers. So we'll start to get that. I'll put a link over in the chat. Um, but before we get too off base, I want to say thank you, Brian. That was wonderful. It was really good to see you around and have you talk more about the process there. So thank you very much.